is um, Um, my piece of the work is called the National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy, and uh, my background uh, is mostly actually uh, in New York for about 15 years. I ran the, um, the large statewide coalition that had about 300 member organizations. A lot of them would be the types of groups that you all are uh, familiar with, and uh, we did a, a lot of work um, focused on uh, how uh, the, the success, how were immigrants and refugees being incorporated uh, into the um, into the fabric of communities, and so my work now has been trying to work at the national level, uh, looking at um, the incorporation of immigrants and their children into the uh, basically into the mainstream of society, and um, all of the rough edges around that. So um so I figured I'm sorry I'm going to be is it all right if I stand here or yeah, how yeah, how bad sure. is that all right? Uh, so I figured that um, Maybe just a little bit more sorry a little more on that. Want me to press the slide? Well, it's real. It's uh. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Do you want me to do the slides for you? No, because they're all animated, so it's going to oh, be like okay. there's. Well, there's a lot of pressing as well. So um. So anyway, so I figured from the title, national policy, local impacts, that you know the reason it's set up that way is that the big controversy is that the national policy is unhinged from the local impacts, and that really is pretty true. Uh, and so that's you know that's the source of um of uh of uh, all sorts of uh, conversations all over the country. So what I'm gonna try and quickly move through is the um, a little bit about rates and numbers, um, just to set the stage. Uh, then um, a little bit about recession effects. Um, uh, speak, speak then um, a lot more about what are some of the responses that are happening to local impacts, because that was part of the charge to us as speakers, you know, to say, well, what, you know, what actually um, are people doing to try and uh, deal with the, with the local impacts in a um, in a constructive or a responsive way. Um, just in case any of you are looking for ide additional ideas or contacts about that, uh, and then um, end by talking a little bit about uh, what it might look like for you all to be getting more engaged in the immigration debate uh, in a constructive way. And that's partly by way of setting up my um, my good friend and colleague Frank Sherry. Uh, whose work is almost um, exclusively devoted to the, you know, to the topic of how to speak about these issues and um, shape the national, uh, local and national conversation on these issues. Um, so, um, so in terms of the, um, just sort of the uh, kind of setting, uh, setting out the conversation. Um, if you look at that dotted blue line, that's when a lot of you were talking about your families coming in. That there are. Um, uh, this, this charts both the share of the, uh, the population in the U.S. that's foreign-born against the actual number that's foreign-born. And um, this, is why you, this is why you often hear this um, uh, sort of uh, the, a little bit of the dissonance of, oh, the numbers are really, 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 really high. And then I uh, know the numbers, they're not really high. You know, this isn't as high as it was back in the, back in the day. Well, so it's the difference between talking about you know, the actual uh, numerical number versus the share. So the number is, yes, extremely high. Um, uh, we're approaching uh, 39 million foreign born in the US, but the share is still a little bit lower than it was at its peak when we had the uh, waves of immigration in the late 1800s. Um, just so you, um, just one more little uh, piece about the numbers. If you count immigrants and their children, you know, which is, uh, uh, partly, uh, no, no, you can't do that. The children are U.S. citizens. Well, part of the local debate is yes, they may be U.S. citizens, but there are particular needs that those children uh, that those children have, or that those families have. So there is right now 73 million uh, people in the U.S. who are either foreign-born or the children of immigrants, and that's a quarter of the U.S. population. And then we could say, well, some of those people are actually like in their 60s and 70s. They were they still count as the children of immigrants. But then, if, then uh, a, a, a sort of closer in focus on that would be that since 1995, I think it is slightly uh, since 1995, I think it's 20. Um, we've added more than 21 million persons just since 1995. So, um, so you know, it's it's a real issue. You can you can feel a lot of different ways about those numbers. Um, but um, but it's real. Then the other thing that's very real is that immigration used to be the domain of just five states: New York, Illinois, California, Texas, and Florida. 
those are states that really uh, were, you know, you, you would have to say more comfortable with the immigration debate. They had built up a lot of service infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, uh, many mayors in New York used to talk about how, you know, why is the rest of the country so upset about immigration? We're the ones who've been doing the work for the country for all these, you know, hundreds of, uh, hundred plus years of, of integrating, making Americans. Uh, out of immigrants who were coming in. But now, uh, particularly in the last 15 to 20 years, this has been a debate for, for much of the country. And as you can see, there's a real clustering of the spread of immigration into the southeastern states and into some of the, um, uh, the southwestern and Rocky Mountain states. And uh, I don't know if you can read that, but the, the deep blue states are the ones with um, a, million, a million and a half plus immigrants. And these other states are those that had 200% or higher growth in the last 15 or 20 years. So, um, so some folks in Congress, when we show them this, uh, sit there and just start naming the names of all the senators from those states who are dead set against immigration and really, um, you know, very much uh, leading the charge a lot of times uh, uh, against immigration reform measures. Um, I'll just say, say personally that uh, I do a lot of work on education issues, um, particularly early childhood and K-12, and also adult literacy and workforce. And it really struck me at uh, doing a roundtable uh, for southeastern states about the changes that their school systems were experiencing a few years ago. And we were uh, uh, speaking with folks who I think were from Georgia and Tennessee, and they were telling me that they didn't even have a degree for teaching ESL education until something like the year before. You know, so how, so, so, so there's just this element of shock also, you know, for a number of states about how do you build capacity uh, to, um, to work with these new populations. And I would just say that that's very real. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen by magic. Then the other, the other important thing about this, um, about the state we're in right now with, uh, with the immigration debate is that, um, well, it, it, you, th this number fluctuates a little bit, but, um, but you know, somewhere around 30% of the foreign born in the country right now are unauthorized. So of course that completely um, torques and changes the immigration debate. It's one thing to be talking about uh, the need to address integration issue for legal immigrants, refugees, and their children. Um, that would be a difficult conversation on its own because of the numbers being very large, because of the uh, concerns about, well, who actually makes up the flow. It's one thing for us to have had this immigration policy in the past. You know, that was, uh, you know, th those, were, those were different times. We weren't in a globalized economy. We weren't losing all these low-end jobs. You know, we weren't offshoring all these different jobs overseas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so, so, so that argument would be taking place anyway, but then on top of that, to have such a large piece of the population be unauthorized and for most of those folks to be filling um, very, uh, often very low skilled jobs has really, really lit the fire um, under this debate and, and caused it, I think, to be such a, uh, such a difficult one for us to have. Uh, I should also say, looking at that uh, percent that are naturalized citizens, you know, that's also, that's also a bit the inoculation that as more and more uh, immigrants are actually becoming enfranchised with the vote, it is forcing a little bit more of a, um, of a balanced debate uh, in, a, in a number of parts of the country. So I just to... I wonder if you could just go back to that slide and just quickly uh, define <coughs> legal temporary versus legal permanent. Uh, legal temporary is folks who are here um, on, uh, on visas where they're like allowed to work uh, for five years. Um, you know, they come in on what are called non-immigrant visas. So they're, they're legally here, but they, they just aren't. Um, most, of the, most of the folks who were there under, uh, who were legal permanent residents are folks who, for example, a family member would petition for them uh, to come in. Uh, but legal temporary tends to be more the, um, the workflow. Right? Yeah. All right, so then just a tiny bit about the recession. So um, that, that um, that's a squiggly line is just the growth of the foreign-born population. These are all months from January uh, up until um, November of last year. This is the period of the technical recession. And as you can see, the numbers of, um, of uh, the, the growth numbers are down through that period, uh, but now they're back up again. So this is another source of the controversy that uh, on the one hand, yes, um, uh, immigration is somewhat sensitive to the economic cycle, but most of that drop off in immigration during the recession 
was that no new, pretty much no new unauthorized people were coming in. Uh, those who were here mostly stayed in place, but because a large chunk of the immigration system is in fact on automatic pilot, uh, people when they have their visas finally come due and their family members are able to join them, uh, immigration just continues. And you know, one of the criticisms is that the immigration, the immigration flow is mostly driven by the decisions of immigrants and their family members. Uh, you know, and this is the legacy of the system that we set up, that we thought of it as a human capital system, that we were, we were bringing in, you know, we were bringing in uh, family members because we thought that, uh, that, fa that, that by having your, um, your family there to help you be settled, you know, that that was actually, that was actually the best way to run the system, or maybe this is a looking backwards uh, rationalization, and I know that it's part of how the Canadians were thinking about their system, that, um, that human, the human capital being there with family members was what was going to allow you to actually do a better job of settling and integrating. You know, increasingly a number of the Western industrialized countries that are really in the immigration business are, are interpreting that differently now and saying that the human capital is much more about what the person brings with them in terms of their education, for example, and that's why a number of those systems are moving more to point systems that give you a little bit of credit for having family members, but much more credit for being younger, speaking the language of the country, having higher degrees, or filling particular uh, places in the workforce. Um, so, um, so, so now, uh, what I what I mainly wanted to um, to talk about was all right. So, what um, you know, what are some of the um, the local responses um, to these um, to these issues? And forgive me, um, you know, that you. You may already be aware of them, but I just wanted to do this in order to set the table. So one of the first places that um, that localities feel the impact is through law enforcement, because uh, as soon as uh, law enforcement entities start to encounter um, immigrants, you come up with the question of immigration status. What do you do if you pick up somebody who's undocumented? Uh, what do you do if somebody doesn't have a driver's license or the forms of ID that you're normally used to you know, to um, to seeing from individuals, and so um, so a, a lot of the initial issues are, are one of the first agencies that really needs to respond is law law enforcement. The second place where we see a lot of um, uh, a lot of, of action uh, clash um, uh, difficulty is around the issue of language diversity. Those of you, I, I think you're all in the social services, human services field. Um, obviously, this is a really big issue for you. Let me just say that. Um, one of the things my shop does is work very closely with folks who are in social service agencies on how to deal with language diversity issues. Um, we, uh, we've set up something called the Language Portal on our, on our website. Lots of folks uh, from both social services, law enforcement, disaster preparedness, uh, and K-12 have been giving us documents. And, and it's almost exclusively people who are in government agencies that we're working with. And so their questions are more you know, what kind of language should I put into a vendor contract so that I make sure I'm getting, you know, that, that I can get my money back if they give me a crummy, you know, a crummy translation. Uh, how much should I be paying for an hour of Urdu, you know, translation? You know, what are people paying for um, uh, as a, um, uh, for a bilingual, uh, bilingual caseworker? You know, what's the differential, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that sort of stuff that this is targeted towards, so I thought maybe for you all that that, you know, and then, and then it's very interesting. Some of these folks are working in places um, like New York that have a language access ordinance, and so they're just charging ahead because they have the power of a local law behind them. And other folks are thinking, oh my God, I just have you know, HHS in Washington breathing down my back, and I'm afraid I'm gonna have a civil rights complaint, but I'm being called before the state assembly or the city council because they're furious that we're giving translations and you know, we have an English only ordinance, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a real range of folks and, and part of it is, well, how do I at least make sure that I don't look stupid, you know, and I, and I don't look like I'm doing the wrong thing and that I'm wasting money, um, you know, since there's a, a fair amount of hostility in some places around providing those services. Um, a third major area is, um, is uh, studying up and figuring out immigration status service eligibility rules. I figure all of you have ways to do this, and if you don't, you know, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different resources that, uh, that we can uh, point you towards in that regard. Um, and, then, <clears throat> and then obviously, um, often you wind, up, um, you wind up having to deal with uh, different types of um, community relations issues. Um, 
one that I'm sure a lot of you have come up against in your local communities is uh, when you have um, corners, uh, you know, day laborer issues, folks um, out on the corner, are you gonna create a hiring site or not? Um, <clears throat> or, um, or issues um, with the uh, integration of refugees. I think that's been very much on the, sort of on the public, um, uh, uh, up in the public uh, debate in a number of communities about the uh, the ability of local refugee uh, refugees to uh, to integrate into the into the local community. So, lots of resources around all of these. Let me just um, let me just say quickly that um, part of the way the responses are, are often uh, organized, particularly within government or among agencies such as your own, um, there are there are just hundreds, I would say, of excellent examples of single agency responses. Uh, both from law enforcement in K-12 education and in healthcare. Um, K-12 education. I was just um, I was just reading uh, reading some materials from Portland, Maine, where they where they're where the lead agency for them in terms of dealing with integration uh, for a lot of their refugees that are coming in. They just decided to place it within the school system, and that the school system has become the multi uh, multi service site for what they're doing. Uh, in a number of other places, um, it's it's really healthcare that's been leading the way because that's where they have more of their infrastructure. Um, probably for all of you, you're familiar with public-private collaborations. Uh, another thing I was recently reading was from the um, United Way of Salt Lake. Some of you may be familiar that they undertook a major uh, integration initiative uh, with leadership out of United Way, but it included. Uh, both a lot of the um, a lot of the government, state and local government agencies there, uh, as well as the um, as well as leadership from the Mormon Church, and they came up with a whole series of investments that they were going to make around immigrant integration that have been underway for a number of years now, and they've also been playing a leadership role in the public um, in the public uh, debate there around immigration. And Frank may talk a little bit more about what's been uh, what's been happening about out there. Um, there are also in quite a few cities. You have your community uh, uh, community foundations. Uh, there's a network of those community foundations that have been working on immigration issues that specifically started collaborations that work both with government uh, and with private funders to address everything from immigration related legal services issues. Uh, 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 domestic violence funding, adult English language classes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, websites and whatnot that you can refer to there. And uh, also public-private, um, there was a fantastic initiative from the Co Colorado Trust, uh, and um, we had been in conversation about maybe we could, um, maybe we could get the person who led that out here. Colorado Trust is a, was mainly a, a, a healthcare-related foundation, but they wound up funding about a dozen immigrant integration initiatives in local communities all over Colorado that were really, uh, you know, there was a, a lot of controversy around immigration and a number of them, uh, Greeley, Colorado, uh, uh, Tom Tancredo, who leads the, um, the uh, sort of anti-immigrant caucus in the Congress uh, in his city, uh, they started these integration initiatives just to start local community dialogues and really think about what could local communities be doing uh, to, to tackle these issues. And then, um, and then finally, there are a lot of examples of cross-agency responses where uh, uh, very often it's governments have set up advisory councils, created special advisor positions, or coordinating offices to address um, immigrant integration issues. You won't be surprised to hear that they're, um, they're very focused on uh, trying to calm things down by gathering information, having a process where it's analyzed, uh, and then recommending actions and overseeing and monitoring implementation. Um, a few examples of that, uh, uh, Montgomery County right here in Maryland um, has had a, a very active initiative that's been, uh, that's, uh, been, been um, convening and uh, developing recommendations dealing with things like language access issues as well as with some of the law enforcement issues. Very significantly, a number of states have done this in a formal way, they have created uh, immigrant integration executive orders, and then uh, those states include Maryland, Illinois, Massachusetts, um, Washington State, and New Jersey. And uh, and those those pre those set into motion statewide processes that looked across agencies that convened people uh, that talked about you know what was the federal federal share in a number of these key issues. What should they be looking for from the federal government? 
but what could they be doing at the uh, at the state level? So, um, so this is all just to say that there's there's a lot uh, out there. So if you would, you know, if you're interested in hearing more about these, um, we can either Frank or I uh, can be in touch with you on email and would be happy to share uh, because a number of these initiatives really do have. Um, there's a fair amount out there about them. Uh, the likely leaders on these are often executive offices, either governor's offices or mayor's offices. You're all probably <coughs> familiar with the um, idea that there are these mayor's offices of immigrant affairs in, quite a, in, a, in a good number of cities. Um, Illinois, I know, has a state level governor's office. And I just wanted to say a tiny bit more about Illinois because your colleague Ed Silverman was the one who originally uh, was um, behind the concept, I believe, for this panel. And as the state refugee coordinator, um, often, often you find in almost, I think every single state has a state refugee coordinator. And since they're the one formal person often in government that whose job has something to do with the foreign born, they wind up being the place that a broader um, conversation about immigration uh, is built around. And that's exactly what happened with Ed out in the state of Illinois. And, and I think rather than try and keep a, rather than either say, oh no, I only deal with refugees, um, or say um, that, um, uh, that uh, well basically, I, th I think that's more the dynamic that a lot of the, um, uh, that you see often is that the refugee flow is separated from the uh, immigrant flow uh, quite explicitly. Um, but but uh, in a number of states, the immigration piece is built onto those offices and I think it, played a very productive role in, uh, in inviting uh, the immigration conversation into state government, uh, creating a lot of resources that people could use, creating quite a few uh, convening processes that brought people together to talk about the impact of immigration in the state. Um, and then I'll just, say, um, I'll just say one more thing about law enforcement, which um, uh, I just, it, it, was a, it was kind of a, uh, just a very funny um, finding that a, a colleague of ours had when he looked at who was playing what role in California in terms of uh, dealing with immigration issues. So um, he he sent out, um, did I say his name, Karthik Ramakrishnan? He's a, he's a, a young professor um, in, uh, I believe, political science. Um, and he, uh, so he sent out a survey to about 300 local governments in, uh, in California, and he sent it to the mayor, um, the head of the city council, and the police chief in all three of these jurisdictions and said, well, so, uh, you know, how are you handling the impact of immigration? Um, for example, what are you doing in terms of uh, accepting driver's licenses? You know, uh, what do you do when you encounter people who are undocumented, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, probably like two thirds of the mayors and the city council leads said, no, we have no policy and oh my God, you know, what are we gonna do about this? And, um, and, and you know, some enormous percentage of the police chiefs just very quickly and clearly answered, you know, this is what we do. And so it really became clear that in many cases it was the it was the police chief that was actually creating the policy, you know, because it was such a real and vivid issue for them. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing is that um, if if your lead local law enforcement person was elected, um, this I don't, this isn't proven, but it certainly seems to be when you when you you know when you uh, when you look at this at least. Um, you know, in a in a in a cursory manner, that um, that if if you, if you're an elected police chief, um, it's a much hotter debate. You're much more afraid. You know, and you play much more to the crowd and to the electorate. Uh, whereas if you're, it's a professionalized um, position and appointment. Uh, it's a much richer conversation, much more balanced. <clears throat> you know, sort of. Uh, well, what's my role in terms of protecting the community versus trying to get myself elected and and playing to the least common denominator. Okay, so now <clears throat> that you've seen that there's all sorts of trouble that people at the local level are going to, trying to figure out how to deal with these implications, and of course I hardly even went into it, you all know from your jobs that this is such a you know, complicated um, set of services that you're trying to think about, you know, um, any of the education issues, any of the social service issues. There's really so much going on as, as folks at the local level try and deal with this. So um, you might be saying, uh, so the federal government realizes this, right? And they've got our back. Um, and um, this is just this is just to say um, that, of course, the um, you know the idea that the feds were going to provide leadership on this—if anybody uh, really thought that was going to happen, 
Um, I would say that this is pretty much where we're at, you know, that the, and where we have been, I would say for what, 10, 15 years, you know, that we're, that it's strictly about the politics of how do we, you know, how do we say we're controlling the border? Um, how do we, how do we, we remain, you know, how do we listen to business about what they want and how do we not really piss off Hispanic voters who are becoming more important, at least in national elections. And there really is no, you know, no easy answer. And so the thought I want to leave you with is that you really aren't going to get leadership from the federal level on this issue. And I don't think, you know, for, and for those of you who are here from Canada, you know, I, um, as I said, my organization does a lot of work internationally, and we actually work a lot also with the European Union. And it's very explicit even there at the European Union level that this is not a competency of a national level government. That immigration has so much to do with your local labor market, your local economy, et cetera, et cetera, that they would never dream of saying that this was a that you know that, that this was something that a, a national government could confidently execute. So I think that's the bind we're in right now is that we have this long history, you know, first of all, a, a pretty laissez-faire attitude. You know, well we're you know we're going to put this system in motion. You know, we promised particularly when we changed it in 1965 that it wasn't going to have any appreciable impacts. Well, you can see from that graph, it has some very appreciable impact. And then, you know, for, for 150 plus years, we've said for either, you know, hey, you're the one who wanted to be here, I don't know you anything, or, you know, hey, this is all gonna work. You know, like we're this magical country, everybody becomes American, you know, we have enough room for everyone, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, in, the, the collision now, you know, between that, you know, th that sort of uh, philosophy about the immigration system and the sort of economy and the, you know, that we're in now in the very, very large and diverse country that we are has really made this a very complicated thing to get out in front of. So what I would say, just as you think about your the immigration debate or your role in it, is that currently you really only have two off-the-shelf options in the, in the national debate. One is it's all good, and the other is it's all bad. And there is nothing but pain and misery for any politician who tries to be in the middle and say, you know, well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's both, or maybe it's maybe it's both at the same time in one community, uh, or you know, maybe it's maybe it's really good for some places and not so good for others. And my example of that is from all, in my work in New York. Before I got into the immigration issues, I was just in city government and we had had a, a major um, process over a many year period to deal with racism in the construction industry in New York because the construction industry was pretty much determined never to hire an African American in New York City. So we had all these commissions and all this work we did to try and address that. Um, and that was in the late 80s and early 90s. And then when immigration really picked up again, boom, the construction industry just leapfrogged over any black person, not just African American, but also Jamaican and immigrant uh, descent, and went right to, right to the Latino and other immigrant population. And so what we were saying in city government at the time was, gee, like we're pretty pro-immigrant and we see the value of immigration. Why can't we have an immigration policy that gets us no day laborers, right, or no people that are gonna come in into that industry and a lot more home health attendants? And so I tell you that for 20 years, I've been thinking the same thing as I look at the immigration debate. You know, why is it that you're just so left to be so passive at the local level and that you can't play any role in this? Um, so, um, so one of the things that, um, that, that, I, that I think we're, we're seeing, and, and part of, I do a lot of work with National League of Cities, and they're always telling me, please come in and just tell us the truth. You know, like, like there's all these conflicting things that people are saying, what's the one true thing? And he said, well, look at all of you. You know, first of all, we have 3,000 3, counties in the U.S. We have over 10,000 cities. I think we have something like an additional 8,000 towns and villages. Look at how smart everybody's tried to get over the last 20 years about their economic development, you know, um, processes, how they're transacting all that business. I think part of that is the good effects of the workforce. And, you know, we, uh, I know that there's, you know, all sorts of ways in which it's not really working, but I feel like everybody's had to get so smart with what's been happening in terms of their local economies, the way they're losing jobs, you know, how are they gonna outcompete other places, et cetera, et cetera. So when you think about how all of that knowledge locally 
is completely ignored and we're just sprinkling a million people based on the decisions that immigrants and their family members make around the country every year, of course it's not going to be something that is going to work well for everyone. And yet, how do you keep alive the idea that A, we have, humani we have a humanitarian <coughs> obligation, uh, you know, we, we're, we're part of this ar around the world in terms of what we're, you know, in terms of our, uh, what our commitment to refugees. Secondly, we still do have an obligation to immigrants and their family members on some level. What is that obligation? What are we going to do about the 10 or 11 million people here, you know, who came in illegally and, and who really have put down deep roots and are probably fairly well incorporated and, you know, are we really going to, do we really have the stomach to try and deport them? And then what do we do about this much bigger system that has been in place, you know, for, for 40 or 50 years now? There's a lot of moving pieces, uh, but there are all these different needs and different impacts at the local level. So, so what I think is that if you really want to take this on, that, that there is an opening right now because we've been so stuck for so long trying to fix this at the federal level, you know, that maybe we could look um, to our friends up in Canada, for example, which does have a system where now the provinces can do an end run around the system and say, I have an immediate need, you know, for X number of people who, you know, that I, I, I know I have jobs for them on or as a population policy, that, um, that, that, that it actually started in one of the provinces more as a population policy. And I, I've been, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop in one second. Uh, but out in Minnesota and in Kansas, where you have all of these um, you know, state demographers and people in these counties that are saying, I only have 1,500 people left in my county. I don't know how I'm gonna provide you know, healthcare. You know, <coughs> you know, like this enormous percent of them are over 70. You know, this whole part of my state is about to die. You know, how do I how do I get immigration to help me with that? So, anyway, I think that there is an opening here, potentially. I think for shared authority in selection, we've seen it in other countries. Maybe that's one of the breakthrough ideas for the immigration debate right now. And then I would also say a favorite issue of mine. <coughs> I think we're long overdue to have a White House <coughs> office on immigrant integration, something at the federal level that starts to be honest that there are all these impacts at the state and local level, create a table for conversation among state, local, um, federal officials. That's not just within the silo of either HHS or Department of Ed, although God knows that would be great to even have that conversation with them, <laughs> but how would you have it across the agencies and start to plug in some of these integration impacts into federal conversations about new immigration policies like the DREAM Act? You know, why are we gonna spill all this blood to pass the DREAM Act when something like 25% of the kids might get through? I mean, yes, 25% of them getting through might be a good thing, but, you know, but, but really, the, this is a much more diverse population than we're saying. There's all these um, implications for state and local, uh, for, for um, state and county level community colleges, et cetera, et cetera. If we're gonna do this, why aren't we gonna try and make it work? And there's no place to, you know, to have that conversation either because the federal conversation is still, when you talk immigration, you're only talking about numbers and categories, you're not talking about integration impacts and whether it can work. So sorry for ta talking probably too long. But, um, <laughs> successful we've been, um, but, uh, and there's a reason why it's been so hard, it's because this debate, as you know, generates more heat than light, and it's very difficult to navigate public opinion and the strong feelings and the passions that arises. I should tell the story, I, I was working in the Boston, Cambridge area in Massachusetts as a local advocate and service provider, and was asked by a friend of mine to address a bunch of uh, state officials, state, uh, they worked in welfare offices or across the state. 
I walked in about 100 people, and I was supposed to explain this new law that passed in 1986 that legalized some undocumented immigrants, penalized the ones who weren't legalized, and created huge confusion for our state service providers who was eligible for what. And so I was trying to explain federal law as if I was responsible for it. <laughs> and, and this crowd erupted on me. I was literally in the middle of my first paragraph, and somebody stood up. This wasn't the Q&A section, right? <laughs> stood up and said, how come they're all on welfare? What? How come they're all on welfare? Hmm. Right? And I didn't know what to do. Right? Deer in the headlight, you know, I've become more experienced in how to handle these tough situations. <laughs> But at the time, I didn't, I just, and then somebody else said, yeah, and they're taking all of our jobs, too. And then a third person stood up and said, when the hell are we going to get rid of these illegal aliens? And I thought, oh my God, so I've lost control, right? I, I'm just standing there, deer in the headlight, didn't know what to do. And a woman stood up in the front row, <laughs> turned around to her colleagues and said, hey, shut up. Oh my God. <laughs> make sense of it. Why is it so hot and how can you talk about it? Um, I was up in Canada just recently. John and I were spent a day together. I'm and, not stalking you. <laughs> and I'm not stalking you, but I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a different environment there and it's because leaders have cultivated a different environment. So we have a more leaderless debate and therefore it's gotten more toxic. So the when, I, want, I want to underscore what Margie was saying about what's now come to be known as integration, local integration of immigrants and refugees, is that the federal policy is you're on your own, essentially. A little bit of help through some of the universal programs, but basically, in some little bit of help for refugees when they first arrive. But except in a few states that have taken it on, really the federal government is saying back of the hand to immigrants, lots of restrictions in terms of what they can get, and then for local communities, figure it out on your own. And a number of cities and a number of states have begun to do that. But as immigrants have spread to so many other states, as Margie showed in the map, it's a real challenge. So I, I, I feel the pain of a lot of you trying to figure out, what the heck do we do? Our communities are changing, the debate has gotten really heated and negative and hostile, and we're trying to figure out how to make it work for our community. So um, the reason that it's been so hard at the federal level with Congress and the White House um, is that there's two very different diagnoses about the major issue that's sucking the oxygen uh, out of the room, which is illegal immigration. So almost a third of the immigrants in the United States are here illegally. 66% of them have been here for longer than a decade. 70% of them live in families. So you may see the guy standing on the street corner living in cut up housing you think they arrived three weeks ago, and there are those people but there's also many rooted families that have been here for a long time, and there's just no line to get into. I'm on talk radio occasionally when they say, why don't they just go to the post office and apply? And I say, if there was such a post office, there would be 11 million people in that line. <laughs> so, if, why didn't they come legally in the first place? Also wasn't a line, right? We have a high-skilled immigration program, we have a family reunification program, we have a small humanitarian refugee asylum program, but for low-skilled workers who want to come and work in the United States, we, we, we didn't, haven't had a workable system for that. So we have a keep out sign at the border and a help wanted sign about 100 yards in. <laughs> and before the Great Recession, the giant sucking sound was workers from Mexico and Central America primarily, and other parts of the world, coming to fill jobs in the United States, particularly in the service industries in those new immigrant states, as well as some of the gateway cities. So you've had lots of folks coming, many of them coming illegally, no federal policy to deal with it effectively, and no federal help to local uh, communities trying to make it work. You know why we say the immigration system's broken? That's why. A legal immigration system, as Marty points out, it's on autopilot. Hard to say it's really responsive to national interest now. It's just been locked in place, and because of the paralysis of Washington, it hasn't been reformed. 
This is because, in large part, so anyway, so the policy debate is it's like two very different diagnoses and prescriptions. One says, these are bad people who have broken our law, and the law is good. The other side says, this is my side, these are mostly good people subjected to really bad laws, so we need to change the laws. So one side says, bad people build a wall, have cops ask for papers when they stop people, right? Let's try to force them out of jobs and housing if we can. Let's deny services. Let's make life so miserable that people, the people that we don't pick up and deport, we'll pick, pick up and self-deport. And the strategy is called attrition through enforcement. It is what many Republicans now in Washington are for. They want people to go home. The other side, a fractious, lively movement for reform that Cheryl Little and I and Margie know very well. Uh, uh, there's certainly the more militant elements that are saying, you know, this is racist and we want reform now. There's others who are saying we need a centrist compromise in which we deal with the 11 million people here practically and humanely by giving them a path to earn legal status and eventual citizenship while making sure we don't reproduce the problem of 11 million undocumented immigrants in the future. We, so you combine smart, accountable border enforcement with a crackdown on illegal hiring, with a path to status and citizenship for those here, and reforms of our legal immigration system so that it's more functional, more flexible. And I, I love the idea of the, sh the sh uh, authority sharing, Marty. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna push that idea, I like it, because I see how it works in Canada, I think it's a great idea. But nevertheless, that's what we call, some, some of refer to referred to as comprehensive immigration reform. So comprehensive immigration reform versus attrition to enforcement. And now what's happened with public opinion is that um, each side has gotten more dug in. So when we first started this debate, uh, when I first engaged this debate 20, 25 years ago, public opinion was about 10% hardcore anti, 10% <coughs> hardcore pro, and the 80% in the middle were split down the middle, right? People aren't like a clear, lot, the people in the middle are having a conversation. Well, they seem like decent people. I know the people down the street work hard, but there's really a lot of them. And you know what? I hate it when I see the, that the, the, my kid's classroom changing, and when I went to an emergency room once, there seemed to be only people from other countries there, and they didn't speak like that. So that's the discussion people are having in their heads, in the middle. And, they're, and, 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 and they sort of go both ways, often by the last person they heard, but split down the middle, leaning one way or leaning the other. 20 years, 25 years later, it's now 20% hardcore pro, 20% hardcore anti, and 60% in the middle, also split down the middle. So there's been a polarization and intensification of the views, and the people in the middle are still like, man, I, you know, I don't know which way to go. So that's why you had this anomaly that most people couldn't figure out, but for us was like, of course it's gonna be this way, when Arizona passed a law that I consider odious, but they passed a, 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 an anti-immigrant law, a very tough law, last year, public opinion polls showed that two-thirds of the people supported it. They understood the frustration, should do something. Those same people preferred comprehensive immigration reform on the path to legal status for the undocumented immigrants in the United States. How can that be? They're frustrated. They want action. And they're basically gonna accept whoever takes action. Folks in the middle, they are frustrated. So, how do you talk about immigrants and immigration? Let's say you're with a planning council. <laughs> Your community's changing, and you wanna take this on, and your colleagues are saying, don't touch it. <laughs> but you say, hey, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, here's just a few tips. Um, it's usually a longer conversation, right, Chad? But nevertheless, we're gonna do this quickly. Um, first of all, you need to know your audience. Yeah. And you need to know what your objective is, right? And this is very tricky, because if you listen to the activists, they're usually speaking to their base of support and trying to expand their base of support in a way that actually alienates people in the middle. I do it all the time, I'm an advocate. I speak to the base, at least I know that I'm aggravating and alienating people in the middle when I'm doing that. But when I speak to folks in the middle, what we call trying to persuade skeptics, that's 60% in the middle, 
and often angers the people in the base who think you're selling us out. And then there's a third element, which is what do you do when somebody's standing up and saying things that really are beyond the bounds of civil discourse? Hateful rhetoric, right? Then you've got to figure out how do you marginalize that? Um, name calling doesn't seem to work very well. <laughs> standing up with responsible people who represent the best of the community and saying that's not who we are can work. Right? So you first have to figure out, am I expanding the base of support? Am I trying to persuade skeptics? Or am I trying to marginalize hate? Three very different kind of uh, challenges there. But let's assume that you're really trying to speak to the middle of folks who are uh, skeptical about whether this the diversified community that, the, that we should take that on. Uh, first of all, it's it's very important to talk about uh, certain realities. So, for example, if I was uh, coaching somebody trying to figure out how to talk about this tough issue in a changing community with a lot of skeptical people and maybe some hostility, first thing I talk about say uh, is we're all frustrated. Acknowledge the frustration. Acknowledge how angry people are with how the federal government hasn't provided leadership, hasn't provided support to local and state communities, how Congress hasn't stepped up and fulfilled their constitutional responsibility. Yes, we're frustrated. But don't stay there and stop there because that will just lead into a whole lot of more hostility and kick them out and, 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 and hateful rhetoric. So it's acknowledge the frustration, say, but, but let's be practical, people are here. And who we are in this community is we try to deal with things realistically and practically and humanely. That's who we are. And these people are not the others, this is the theme, not the others, They're, they actually are working, they have families, their kids are going to school, they go to uh, churches and synagogues and, and mosques, they're faith, a strong faith tradition, and they, they, they're, they're pursuing the American dream, can't we figure out how to make it work for all of us, all right? So, go, so, so yes, there's frustration, but folks are here, and we gotta, um, we gotta make it work for all of us. If the debate, the second uh, tip, emphasize solutions, not problems, right? So if the debate is about is illegal immigration or are immigrants causing problems, I promise you, you will lose that debate. You will. If the debate shifts to what can we do to make it better, you can win that debate. You might not win the debate, but you can win the debate, that debate. And it really transforms the discussion. Transforms the discussion. But you've got to figure out what is it that we can do? What are the solutions? That's why what Margie's work is, trying to come up with the best ideas, is really revolutionary. Right for, you know, it's a real breakthrough because a lot of folks have been asking what are the solutions and finally there's uh, an attempt to catalog some of the, uh, and promote the, some of the best practices that are coming from the bottom up. And then finally, the third uh, tip would be to emphasize shared values. To talk about who immigrants are in terms of shared values, who we are as a community or a state or a county in terms of what we stand for, um, and and to, and to make a plea for leadership, because that's what the key, we were talking about it earlier. Leadership is the missing ingredient. And it takes a lot of guts to run to the gunfire on this one. And it's the only way forward towards solution. And, and look, and it's not, the, Mar Margie's right, if the debate is all good or all bad, that's not, that's not gonna work. Look, there's a frustration, because people want some sort of sense of orderliness, some sense of control, some sense of limits. I'm all for it. But I'm also for dealing practically and humanely with people in our community that are saying, you know, that are here. And, and if we just ignore it or say that somehow we're gonna make them disappear magically, that's not realistic, nor is it humane. So talking about who we are as a community, who we are as a county, what we stand for, how we're gonna make it work for all is a very powerful turbocharger of practical solutions that make it work for all, dealing with people who are already here. So um, this is a big, messy debate. You know this. You know, I, I have family too. I, I go to I go to family reunions and family dinners. <laughs> you know, there's that there's that you know, Aunt Margie at the end of the table says Frankie. <laughs> My 
nephew Frankie, what is it that you do? <laughs> and I think it's going to start. <laughs> sure, I know. So uh, I work uh, on a public policy issue. <laughs> what? What issue? <laughs> Immigration. Ah, for Christ's sake. You know. <laughs> I get it. You know, um, it's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. And it's necessary. It's necessary that we have the kind of guts and leadership that leans into this issue in a way that pushes for solutions that are in line with our values and deals realistically with the fact that our communities and states have changed. 